Welcome back, everybody, to Streaming Media Connect 2023. I'm your host, Evan Shapiro, or MC Evan Shapiro. Um, uh, we have a great panel coming up, keeping up with the fast ecosystem, uh, a, a, um, uh, a topic real close and, and near to my heart. Um, before we get started with the panel, though, um, I want to make sure that you understand that you have to put your guesses for the song and the band that was just playing during the stream up to the, the panel uh, in the chat. The first person who is here at the end of this panel, and everyone's going to be here at the end of this panel because it's going to be fascinating. As you can see, we have some great panelists who are eager to get to the stage. Um, whoever's here at the at the end, who is the first person to put the name of the song, and uh, the band in the chat will win a $50 gift card from Amazon. We're doing that every single uh, panel uh, today for the rest of the day. And all the panels from today and the previous uh, two days of Streaming Media Connect will be up on Streaming Media's YouTube page next week. There'll be uh, Steve will put a link in the chat. And speaking of that, that's what the chat is for. Links, links to bios of our panelists, uh, links to YouTube pages, answers to the song and the band so you can win your $50 gift card. It's not for questions. The questions are supposed to go in the Q&A. That's where our moderator, when he comes to the stage at the end of the panel, will ask all your cues so he can get your A's for you from our panelists. Um, I think that's all I have to get out there. Um, we have a really great uh, uh, panel coming up now. Once again, look for all these panels on the Streaming Media Connect YouTube page next week. And without further ado, I'm going to bring our moderator for um, the Fast Ecosystem panel to the stage, Chris Path of Chris Path Tech Media. Hey, Chris. Have a good Hi, panel, Evan. Man. Great to see you, as always. And, great to see uh, you. Great, great to talk about a topic that uh, uh, we're, we're all quite uh, deep into, uh, and it keeps expanding. Fascinated with, if you yeah. will. And that, that's my dad joke. Well, it, you know, the dad can be fascinated and the kids can too, because they're watching uh, mostly. Uh, but this uh, panel uh, is, uh, is is populated. And for those who are just tuning in, uh, this is the Fast Ecosystem fa panel or Fast Times, keeping up with the evolving Fast Ecosystem. Uh, as Evan mentioned, I am your moderator, Chris Paff. I'm the CEO of Chris Paff Tech Media, LLC. Uh, uh, one of the founders of the New Media Council, the Producers Guild of America, among other things. Uh, I've been working uh, in this OTT and fast space for a long time. I, uh, I I can't wait to bring a panelist to the stage. First and foremost, Christina Chung, who's the VP of Business Operations with Estrella Media, uh, who's just moved back to the New York area. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Chris. And uh, secondly, we have Jeff Clanagan. Uh, President and Chief Distribution Officer with Heartbeat. Yes, that's right. Kevin Hart's company. Welcome, Jeff. You're right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, also from L.A., Damian Pellicchioni, uh, my uh, dear uh, colleague uh, for many years. He's the CEO and the co-founder of Reverie. Welcome, Thanks. Damian. Hi, everyone. Last but not least is Marissa Elizondo. She's the VP of Content Strategy and Acquisition at Fubo. Welcome, Marissa. Thanks, Chris. Great. So great, great names. Most of you know uh, these companies and brands, but, uh, you know, this this is a, a, a way to look at the sort of the full spectrum of fast. And one of the things we're just going to just touch on is something that uh, sort of the fast godfather, Alan Walk, the man who coined that term free ad supported streaming television, talked a couple of months ago about fast 2.0, or as I like to call it, fast goes to college. Uh, which is really just pointing to the maturation of fast. Um, for example, there was a report that our friends at Samba TV came out with last week on the state of viewership, which showed that one in three U.S. Uh, viewers subscribe to a free service, uh, Freebie, and Amazon saw very high growth. Uh, but um, uh, we're seeing things from Pluto and Tubi uh, up seven and five percent. Crackle. Of course, we'll talk more about them in a moment, but it's not just the big guys. Of course, it's the independents. We'll talk about them uh, in a minute. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I kind of want to start because, uh, you, you know, we're in a, a kind of a, a, a little bit of a darkness uh, here with the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strikes. Uh, Peak TV really has peaked. I mean, last year there were a record 599 new shows that aired. Uh, but the question that I have for you is, is this really the moment for FAST to reinvent itself? Are viewers more likely to return uh, to whether it's passion brands or social influencers? Uh, Jeff, for example, I mean, I know you're uh, doing a lot with YouTube these days. 
are you are you seeing more uh, people sort of moving in that direction from your side? Well, what I would say is we're seeing um, more growth in viewership minutes and as well as as starts. Now, I think with the caveat though is that where we're seeing that growth is is on the big the ones you just mentioned. So, for example, Tubi, Pluto, um, Samsung, Roku. That's where we're seeing the growth at in terms of um, viewership and numbers. Um, we are, you know, we just launched a fast channel on our YouTube page, which is doing extremely well. We've only been up about four months. Now, the advantage that we had in doing that is we already had a YouTube page that had five million subscribers on it. So what we were able to do is, which I think only a couple of people have done it, we launched our fast stream on our YouTube page versus a separate fast stream in another environment in YouTube. So we were able to tap into that that audience that we've already curated. That's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, and and that's that's in the last couple of months, it sounds like. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Again. So so this is very interesting to track that. Marissa, how, how about you? What are you seeing during this period? Again, we're we're now sort of four months into some of these strikes, but it's also uh, again, you know, uh, peak TV has has kind of peaked. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, and for those who don't know, uh, you know, Fubo does have uh, some really interesting uh, fast titles and, and Marissa, you, you can give us a, a lens into to what you're doing there. Sure. So um, as many of you know, Fubo is a, is a live streaming platform. We're sports focused. We've le leaned in very heavily over the past year into the fast space thinking, okay, hey, there probably is a happy medium between the fast, the fast world and the kind of the traditional linear nets. So over the past year, we had, we were thinking we would take a kind of slow and steady approach to launching fast channels. And we actually leaned in quite heavily and launched over a, about 100 channels, fast channels. Um, and what's unique about us is that we've mixed them in between all of the packaging. So if you pulled up our channel lineup, you would see that all of the fast channels are kind of mixed in. And um, it's been great. We've had, we have, despite the strikes, we have had a, still a ton of inbound requests um, of new networks that are trying to get launched, trying to get eyeballs. So uh, I'm rather busy in taking in taking all of those, but I don't I don't think anything the strikes have have uh, deterred any independent nets or new nets from trying to get additional distribution. That's great. And and Christina, how about you? Again, uh, you know, you've got uh, some some really uh, strong uh, viewership for some of your shows. I mean, but what what's sort of the state of fast in in uh, the last two quarters uh, during this this weird period? Yeah, sure. So I would definitely say Fast has grown significantly. I like to just start by saying Australia Media comes from a traditional broadcast cable business, and we've grown our um, distribution into digital only in the last three years. And that's when I joined on board. And our business has really grown from a fast distribution at, you know, zero dollars to a multi-million dollar business, which is like a huge success for, for Australia. And, um, you know, uh, we work with a number of different partners, such as Fubo, as an example, where we have our four channels, Australia TV, Australia News, Australia Games, and Cine Australia, which is our movie channel. And um, we've seen a, an astronomical growth because I think viewers in, um, in the world are looking for places where they can find content outside of just buying a cable subscription or a broadcast subscription. So, um, you know, it, it is an opportunity to have a free ad supported television experience that is very similar to the traditional linear business. And Australia has put all of our, um, you know, marketing dollars into fast as well as we do have our own app and AustraliaTV.com. But, you know, fast is our bread and butter at this point. We've been kind of growing this business since the beginning of, of fast starting about three years ago. And it's it's really kind of grown into this behemoth where we work very closely with all of our different distribution partners and we work on different content strategies with, with each of them. That's, uh, yeah, and and uh, kudos to you on that because uh, of course I, I think that uh, many people who don't know much about Fast uh, would say, hey, that sounds like linear TV over IP and <laughs> you would be right. You you would win that gift card. Uh, and by the way, uh, great Irish music to pose. Uh, so Damien, <laughs> you, you've, you've been at this longer than most people uh, yeah. and kudos to you uh, if you want to uh, 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 you know, tout some of your recent successes, um, particularly with event-driven content. W what yeah. are you seeing during this this period? Uh, I, I mean, it, it, do you do you think that that this is a bit of a tipping point here for Fast? For sure, I think it's a tipping point. You know, Revry, we've been doing Fast since 2017. We launched our first Fast channel in 2017 on Pluto, 
2018 on Zumo. Now we have about 45 distribution partners. Fubo being one of them has our domestic feed. Um, hopefully we'll take a few more of our, our fast channels very soon. Um, you know, and what's really unique, I think about us is we're addressing a very not, I, I don't use the word niche anymore, but um, the third largest consumer purchasing group in the United States, which spends 1.7 trillion a year in disposable income, which is the LGBTQ um, community. Um, and so, you know, right now, you know, we've won so many big accounts and brands working with companies like CPG companies like Henkel with got to be um, Nike, we just did a huge sports voguing show around, um, you know, working with uh, Discover Card coming up on our Queer X Awards. Um, you know, we've just been in such major sales mode um, for all of our originals in our media, our inventory. It's been explosive growth. We've had doubled our income year over year, and uh, we're expanding the team and we're in the, an investment raise right now. And, and, you know, uh, the, the big game for all of you uh, early on, and, and obviously, particularly for you, Damien, was distribution, distribution, yeah. distribution, distribution. Uh, and, and that continues. Um, you know, I was at Podcast Movement in Denver uh, earlier this week, uh, launched something with a client called Podfast TV uh, with Podcast One TV and others. So it's bringing podcast, podcast content into fast. So you know, there, there's more innovation happening every day in fast. But I think, that, you know, Damien, I mean, What's interesting is a lot of people think, well, yeah, I've heard of these guys, Reverie and what they're doing. They've got these brands. They're fast. This yeah. isn't subscription. <laughs> this isn't even Avon. How do you do that? Um, and and uh, and shout out to our mutual friend, John Lear, for his show. Uh, but but, uh, but are you are you finding that producers, you know, like John and others are coming to you saying, I see something really, uh, you know, both subversive and also uh, very clever in, in that strategy of pulling people in who have disposable income, brands who want to attach themselves because there's an audience, not because they just like throwing cash around. Um, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like, how yeah. I, 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 do you find other people who are looking to, you know, pay you flattery by imitation or, or <laughs> like where, 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 where is that going? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that we did is we built distribution and built audience. You know, we're over 5 million monthly active viewers across all of our, our apps and channels um, with like almost 80% of that coming exclusively from our fast channel partners. Um, and we've leveraged the opportunity to sell that inventory at really high CPMs. You know, we're selling uh, at the height during pride season at $50, $60 CPMs, the entry point being 35 because we're you know, a very affluent market. We have the most amount of scale of video inventory in CTV addressing this market. And we've not been challenged. We're really the thought leader in this space. And I think the biggest thing is brands are looking for other ways to tap audiences. Content, you know, outside of just buying inventory, content being the most effective way and having great content, obviously that takes the cake. Where our original programming is completely underwritten by brands, de-risking all of the opportunity, us owning all of that IP and the brand seeing upwards of, you know, we just had an ad week article I put in the chat come out last week um, where we announced- we put it back. Yeah. Oh, I'll put, I'll, I'll drop it back in. I know it was in our, our previous conversation, but we, um, you know, we did over 1.5 million views in two weeks for a Vogue competition show that was completely underwritten by Henkel's got to be brand, uh, the hair gel and hair dye, which I'm wearing right now and Nike, which I'm also wearing right now. I, I obviously like to uh, support all the brands that support us. Okay, and we're on the red carpet. Who are you wearing? <laughs> and shout out. Shout out to John Lear and Mark and Linda, Triple Threat Productions. You know, we're seeing Emmy, multi Emmy award winning producers. Um, Mark has five Emmys for Queer Eye. He's nominated currently. Linda having one for Key and Peel, currently nominated for um, a Black Lady Sketch Comedy Show. You know, producers from traditional media are trying to get into the fast market and the AVOD market and work with, you know, networks like Reverie because they see us scaling our business, scaling our original content opportunity, working with brands um, and creating, you know, we only create unscripted content from an original right. standpoint right. and seeing opportunity with like Drag Latina, which Triple Threat is producing for us right now. We did a million live impressions when we announced that show 
when we actually premiered season one last fall and they're producing season two right now as we speak in Los Angeles. Amazing. So I, I want, want to uh, get, get to, to uh, this question for everybody. Uh, I'll st start with you, Damien, because of course, somebody we both know and worked with, uh, Paul uh, Cantonis, who, who's one of the founders of the New Fronts through IAB. Uh, yes. You know, anyone who, would, who didn't know anything about this space, but knew something about you know, digital and the new fronts would say, hey, uh, what Damien's talking about sounds like MCNs, right? You know, <laughs> if built, uh, is that what this is? And 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 so the question is, is, is fast moving into that space for uh, new fronts and for brands? Um, and 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 Damien has nodded yes. But Jeff, uh, you've got, you know, this, this incredible uh, portfolio of IP and, and yes, Kevin Hart himself. How how are you you know sort of migrating into fast with your your brands and is it, you know what what's that strategy like? Well, we um kind of same kind of similar strategy that Damien just outlined. We do have a lot of our premium program that is branded. Um, you know, our, our biggest program on our fast network is Cold as Balls, which we're going into like our eighth and ninth season, which is Kevin Hart talk show in a tub interviewing athletes. Um, that's that's funded by Old Spice. Um, so we have a number of shows like that, that are brand oriented, but to your point, right, I, I kind of shook my head when you said, is this MCNs? I mean, I think that's a, that's a very interesting analogy because we, we're actually looking at launching other channels. For example, we actually have a stand-up channel that's dedicated just to stand-up. We're looking at similar to what you guys are. We have a lot of, you know, we have a big podcast business, but we need to transfer that into more of a podcast business. And it doesn't make sense, um, to spin that off as a as its own channel. So I think there are similarities to the MCN model, although different, but it's still you're you're managing a group of a, a group of channels with um different programming. Yeah, yeah. And and Marissa, how about you? I mean, with respect to that conversation around brands. Uh and... go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, <clears throat> it's interesting because we, when we decided to lean in heavily into the fast space, we had always obviously done business with traditional linear nets and we were worried about, oh, how are, how are folks going to react to this? Because they can go on some platforms and get this for free, but do they realize, oh, hey, if they pay a subscription and, and still get, and still get this content, do they see that as additive or do they see that as a disadvantage somehow? Um, but what we found so far is by just by adding as much as we did last year, not taking everything that's out there because we've known that the the quantity and the quality has gotten much better over the past couple of years. Um, but it's been a good experiment for us. I think Fubo's young enough that we're not afraid to experiment in the space as far as kind of seeing what genres are doing well. We were trying to scoop up as much sports related content as possible, whether that was live live sporting events or ancillary content or documented sports documentaries or movies, what have you. But then also realizing, okay, there's other folks in the household or once that gamer match is over, then what? Um, so we found that the viewership has been increasing overall. Engagement has increased across the board. And, and for us, it's been good from a competitive standpoint. Because when it's time for us to do those traditional linear renewals with, with, with the Chris Medias of the world, we can say, hey, great, we do have other good content here that's free. You know, what? how do, how do we tackle this? Um, so over the past year, our fast initiatives have been fast, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, they've been they've been steady, and uh, it's been a success so far. Yeah, and and um, you know, full disclosure, I subscribed to Fubo for uh, when it was Fubo TV for four seasons, uh, four years, so I could watch FC uh, Barcelona because mm -hmm. that was the only way to do it uh, right. when Senor Messi was El Rey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but a lot of great stuff. I mean, it, it's it, it's very it's innovative. Uh, and and of course, you also work with trusted media brands uh, as well, right? And and so it's interesting how how you you've sort of migrated and and from the value standpoint, as you mentioned, you can talk to Chris Media and others who see, uh, w you know, where you're going with this. And and uh, and and just to stay stay with you, for Mercy, for a second, do you mm -hmm. find and 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 I I think all of you can speak to this that there is some aspect of experimentation that's going on as well with Fast. Correct. And I think that's one of the advantages we've we've had. <clears throat> and one of the strategic moves that we've made is that, like I mentioned, all of our fast channels are behind the paywall and they are mixed in among all of our packaging. What we've done from an EPG standpoint is we've uh, launched content with like genres. 
So we, it's not like we take all the fast channels and ban them into Siberia in the thousands channel. Uh, we don't have any channel numbers on Fubo, but we're putting like content with like content. So travel is going with travel, general entertainment is going with general entertainment, crime is going with crime. And so from a discoverability perspective, folks are just one click up or down from finding something new. And as you know, not every fast channel's name says what it is. The Marissa channel, <laughs> you might not know what that is, right? And so if you're if you're looking for food or whatever, and you can kind of scroll down and say, oh, the Marissa channel is great, then you have a little bit more uh, opportunity to experiment, check it out and see how it does. Yeah, the Marissa channel was Marissa Mayer uh, from Yahoo. It was a <laughs> uh, 24 hour feed of her and it got canceled. After yeah, one season. not great. <laughs> Go anywhere. Sorry, sorry people. Uh, Christina, talk, talk about, you know, the what you're doing with brands and, you know, this whole sort of strategy and, and, you know, as you alluded to, for those who didn't know uh, that you, you have migrated from being this, this traditional broadcast entity into being now an emerging power player and fast. Yeah, certainly. So kind of what Marissa and Damien were saying before, it's really kind of packaging those um, opportunities with our distribution partners. So we work very closely with our, our partners to make sure that we are as visible as possible. We produce, you know, a lot of Spanish content. So we are one of the large producers of Spanish language content in the U.S. And we have a lot of viewers that we want to make sure we provide our content to. Um, and so um, being Hispanic um, in nature, we do try to work with our different distribution to kind of what Marissa was saying is bucket it into certain genres. So not just kind of flipping through a certain channel, but really getting into like a little bit more of the UI aspect of it. So how do we make sure that we're easily discoverable to all of our different um, uh, uh, con uh, consumers? So when they go onto Samsung TV Plus or they go to Fubo, they can very easily find Australia TV or Australia News. Um, as an example, like we've, we've noticed that there's a lot of consumers who kind of flip channels, very similar to how linear television um, approach was. So what they do is sometimes they'll go from like watching a movie and then sometimes they, you know, at some point in time, they're like, oh, let me go switch to the news. And so what we've known, what we've learned is that consumers actually do a lot of switching back and forth, but being able to find what channels they're most interested in based on their watch time or by their sessions, we can actually determine what is their user story or what's their user path. And we can very easily with our distributors have some sort of like setting or um, preferential page so that they can just very easily channel through what they really want. Um, and so we've been working very closely with the, some of our distribution partners to, to enable some of that functionality. Yeah, and you know, you're in, an, in a, a very interesting position uh, because uh, of course the, uh, the Latino market is incredibly brand loyal uh, yes. and over indexes in uh, certainly mobile consumption, among others. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to see numbers that are more specific to fast. So, you know, maybe Omdia will come out with that. But talk, talk, talk to that you know, side of your audience in terms of how you're working with brands, because I've done a lot of work with uh, Univision, now Televisa Univision over the mm -hmm. years. Uh, with clients. So I'm just curious if you can talk to that for, for our audience. Yeah. So um, it, you're, you're talking in terms of like how we're able to package our, our, to the to sales team. Absolutely. And things. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So I think there is a, a little bit of an education that also needs to happen. So I think that brands and advertisers not are not always familiar with the term fast. And so what has really helped us is making sure that we educate them, or rather my sales team educates them on what is fast and how it's very similar to linear television. And how do we make sure we are able to transition that knowledge into what is fast and how we can actually help them in a more um, uh, capable scenario. I mean, at the end of the day, digital has way more information than linear. And so we're able to say to our sales team that, hey, you can get all these different targeting capabilities that you wouldn't otherwise have with linear. And you can also have, um, you can potentially go with certain shows or channels. Um, we've been able to be very, um, we've been able to work very well with our different distribution or not distribution, sorry, our different sales partners um, and clients and be able to kind of cater to their needs because of their unfamiliarity necessarily with the fast business. So we're able to kind of bring a bridge together between linear and, and our fast channel. Don't you think it'd be easier for them to just say, 
hey, it took you a while to figure out that YouTube thing in the MCN world. Well, we're just TV. We're just, that's just TV, you know. It's you not know, it would be. But at the end of the, I know I was at the IB Leadership Summit and the dollars are just not similar, right? So like at the end of the day, like it's really difficult to, to say, yes, linear and, and fast are exactly the same because they really truly are not. In, in my opinion, I come from digital. I, I ran through free will for quite some time. And, you know, at the end of the day, my vision is that digital is way, it, it has way more information than what was traditionally well, available. Well, th and, this is it. And of course, you know, um, the, the big elephant in the room on that is Nielsen, uh, who bamboozled people for decades. I mean, um, you know, I, I had, had uh, some clients who were acquired by them. Uh, and their gauge numbers recently showed that Tubi and Pluto TV are among the most watched streaming services, not that far behind Disney Plus. But of course, we also know, uh, as recently shown, that linear TV is now dipped below 50 percent, uh, finally. Uh, so I would think that that fast and certainly that free part of it uh, would get very, very interesting for you. And by, by the way, you, you mentioned IAB leadership. For those who don't know. Uh, and please, uh, you know, don't be shy, Marissa and Jeff, put your bona fides in the chat. But uh, Christina was just named uh, to the 40 under 40 list. Right. Uh, why don't you talk yes, about thank that? Thank you. Just for 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, but tell them what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was through TV week and um, I got. I got selected as one of the winners of 40 under 40. It's a really proud moment for honestly, not just myself, but my entire team who's really helped us to build Estrella's digital business. And so yeah. um, it's an accomplishment just showing how, how well we've been able to, to do over the last three years over at Estrella. Well, kudos, kudos to you. Keep up the, the good work there. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, SVOD, uh, believe it or not. Um, and, and that's essentially uh, what's happening in terms of what has been called streamflation. Uh, I think that was really Bill Flint in the, the Wall Street Journal. Are, are you benefiting at all? And this is for everybody uh, from, you know, this sort of streamflation, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, burgeoning SVOD um, uh, fees. Uh, is, is, do, you, do you think that people are, are they cutting the cord or are they watching fast more or is, is that something, I mean, Marissa, I, I mean, again, for, for, for you, of course you are a subscription service, but do, do, do you feel that? Do you see any numbers? Is there, there's something tangible in, in that? Sure. So I think the benefit that we have as a distributor is that we are an aggregator of content. So we have a little bit of everything. We have SVOD services. We have traditional live near events. We have live sporting events. Uh, we have fast now into the space, some AVOD. So for us, it's while, while content providers keep kind of dividing up and kind of divvying up and, and uh, pushing content to their own plus platforms, we have the benefit of being able to aggregate all of that, to be more of a one-stop shop, to find that specific game or match. And so for us, while the traditional cable providers are bleeding subs, we've definitely seen our sub uh, counts increase. We're at, we're at 1.1 million in our second quarter results in uh, North America, and we've seen that just continue growth over growth <clears throat> year over year. The second half of the year is always our busiest year, a uh, busiest part of the year. We have the NFL coming back, everything, everyone's going back to school, college sports are coming back. So for us, we just hope that we'll just continue to see that momentum go um, go up for the remainder of the year. But for us, that's the benefit that we have is that we have a little bit of everything. We have those relationships with the traditional folks, as well as the independent content providers to be able to combine it all and give folks a little bit of everything, whatever they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, you 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 really originally. I mean, when I was subscribing to you, I saw you was like, wow, you guys really do kind of have everything. Uh, it was almost like a, a YouTube TV, if you will. Uh, I mean, Jeff, how about you? I mean, are you you feeling that that people are coming to and you you've got great content. I mean, who wouldn't want to watch for free? I mean, you know, you've you've got some killer stuff there. Yeah, we're probably in a a different, a unique situation in that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say our viewership is going up because of S5 subscriptions, but our business is we also have a studio and a production unit. And we have a first look deal with Netflix for scripted and then a first look deal with Peacock for unscripted. That business is very healthy. So we're, we have a lot of content we're producing. So if the S bods are doing well, we're doing well because we're producing, we're producing content. So we have, it's, it, it impacts a separate part of our business, but yes, we do benefit from that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great prong, you know, to have uh, that. I mean, that's a classic kind of Hollywood model. Christina, uh, you know, how about you? I mean, are you kind of feeling that a little bit? Yeah. So I think what's interesting about our Estrella's uh, media is that we do have a very big production team. We have our own studios and we produce over 6,000 hours of content a year. Um, but what we tra tra traditionally, traditionally do is we do keep it in-house. We don't we don't always distribute our content out. So that way, all of our premium content are on our platforms, whether it be Fast or our Australia TV app or our dot com. So we do have it all available on Australia's properties. Um, we have worked with a few distribution partners. Um, so like, for example, Netflix hosts had our Rica Famosa Latina um, show, which is kind of like the Desperate Housewives um, for, for Hispanic culture. And so we do have um, some content that we do distribute out, but we do typically keep a lot of our distribution um, in-house and we work with our distribution partners on Australia oriented channels for that. Yeah. D Damien, I mean, is, is, there, is there anything that you're seeing uh, on this, uh, either on the micro or macro level? Yeah. I mean, like for us, it's very different because we're focused on a community where the vast majority of that population is millennial Gen Z. 76% of our 5 million monthly active viewers are under the age of 45. And we're seeing that trend continue to rise. They don't want to pay for things. They want to watch for free and they don't mind ads. And a third of the planet's population is Gen Z and they're growing up and they're going to be the addressable consumer for all, everybody on this call sooner than later. And so you have to be able to speak to that audience, tap that audience and figure out how to get them to consume. You know, I think Jeff made a point about watch times going up. You know, that is our overall KPI because our assumption is if, you know, we have longer watch periods, then we've got more ad inventory to sell. Um, and that is the crux of how we generate revenue. And and let's stay stay with you on this, and and uh, you know because it's fascinating. I mean, uh, you know, I I was talking to David Fannin not long ago, and he was talking about an early deal he did with Netflix with popcorn flicks. This is like ten years ago, where you know they didn't really understand the business, and he you know suddenly they they realized that he was getting a king's ransom. Well, I mean, you know, in terms of um, uh, rev share, I mean. Uh, it, 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 you know, I know some of you don't want to talk about that, but Damien, uh, I'm happy talk, to talk about it. That's why I'm talking to you. So let's talk, talk about let's it talk for those about, out there in the audience, you know? Yeah. Let's talk about, let, let's talk about the elephant in the room for a second. So we cannot as channel publishers build business models on rev share from the OEMs and the operators that does not work. And especially when the needle uh, keeps moving, whether or not they want to take more of that percentage of rev share, or if they want to take, you know, again, more of that inventory split, you know, our best partners do a 50, 50 inventory split. Cause let's face it in our case, no one sells LGBTQ better than me. And I'll say this, like, I, 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 I don't know anyone in the fast operator market who's doing $50, $60 CPMs. I challenge that. Our entry point's 35 and we're completely sold out direct. Our issue was how do we scale that inventory? So off of our new fronts presentation, we announced Prism Riot, which is now the world's first LGBTQ ad network. And last month we saw half a billion ad requests with all of our CTV partners who have signed on to say, you know what? You're right. Revry does sell it better than us. So we're going to we're going to reverse the rev and we're going to allow you to represent the inventory and then scale back to us. Um, you know, this is the world in which we're living in and I think spe especially as it relates to minority owned and operated businesses like Revry. You know, we are 50% black women owned and operated. I'm non-binary. We have our chief content officer who's an Hispanic gay man, you know, and we have certifications like the Minority Business Enterprise Supply Chain, um, the DBE, Disadvantaged Supply Chain, the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, which allows us to tap pools of money that nobody else does, not in mainstream. For instance, Procter & Gamble at their upfronts this year said, we're gonna spend 2 billion in multicultural, 2 billion, but you have to have a certification in order to be able to tap that that pool of money. So we're not competing um, you know, with Marissa's um, sellers or with Pluto's sellers or anybody else's. We're sitting in rooms that they'll never be invited to because they're not, they don't have that same ownership profile. And so there is a group that was launched called the Independent Streaming Alliance. Um, Reverie was one of the first founding members, Vivo, Trusted Media Brands, Chicken Soup for the Soul and Crackle Connects. All of these guys have started this group and we've signed on 
over, I think, 35 different publishers. And we've got some big announcements um, coming up on Advertising Week for some new folks, some bigger, bigger players. You cannot be owned by a major eight. I'm going to drop the link in the chat. And when we did a test with iSpot, we saw that almost 60% of all inventory and 60% of all viewership were coming from just the folks who are in this group alone. So there is going to be a collective bargaining. There's going to be a pushback on those folks who are saying, no, we only want rev share with the publishers. And you know, I think that there's going to be a reckoning very soon. And a lot of it just has to go down to dollars and cents and people letting go of control. Yeah, and 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 bravo, uh, because I, I obviously I agree with you. I mean, I think that the demographics show this, but also this moment, this tipping point that I alluded to earlier in the post-pandemic period, we saw a subscription fatigue uh, coming out of the pandemic. Of course, people were just binge watching. I'd never really binge watched until 2020. Uh, but I think now, uh, you know, we're getting to some interesting things that Christina alluded to with respect to discoverability getting to the right UX UI design for your audience. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, the others would agree with Damien's point about uh, what the, uh, what the skew is there, that it, it is, it is, it is a younger audience. It is a millennial, you know, let's say sub 40 or sub 45. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty, pretty good there for advertisers. I would say uh, it's not just people who are watching Matlock on Pluto TV and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> Actually, but, uh, I, I had I wanted to I wanted to chime into what Damien was saying. I actually wanted to take it a step further. Um, so Damien, I'm totally aligned with you. I totally agree with you. We're having the same exact issues you are. As Hispanic, we know our Hispanic audiences. We know our advertisers and agencies, and we know how to accelerate it. We have higher CPMs than what would generally be in the market. So we are with you on that piece. But I would take it a step further that instead of 50%, I think we should sell more than that. I think that there should be ways to sell more inventory where everyone's yeah. going to make more money at the end of the day. And so you should, the people who are the experts in selling this, the content who knows how to sell this particular audience, they should be ones holding more access to inventory. So things such as like, whether, whether it's like maybe a buyback or a passback or it, having like a better, more favorable inventory share. These are things that we need to talk about with our distribution partners. And I, myself, that's kind of like what my role is. So like, that's some of the things that we're talking with our distribution partners to do. Because at the end of the day, it's all about making money. We want to have the most amount of revenue for every single person, or so, sorry, for, for both parties involved. And so in order to do that, put the experts in the field, let them do their work I mean, this and is so we can a get moment, more revenue. This is a moment for you, for those who don't know, maybe you, you don't read the trades or you don't drink beer, but uh, Modelo is the number one beer in the United States. Uh, now people say, well, you know, Corona was a big deal. I don't think Corona was ever number one, sorry. Uh, this is kind of a big deal. And and the problem is that we always ignore things when they move over. Oh yeah, of course I knew that. I um, I don't want to get into the Bud Light controversy, but I mean, there's a reason for that. And it goes back to an, an agency and an influencer that has been targeted from our community, which is completely unfortunate and uncalled for. Right. But, you know, in, to some extent, it's also that horrible thing of nobody in the room. Right. You know, the wrong people in the room or nobody in the room. And Jeff, you know, I mean, you, you've definitely seen that. But I want to talk about Old Spice for a second. Uh, uh, if you can point to that, because I think that's 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 a brilliant into brand integration with what you're doing. Okay, first I'll say is um, 100 percent in line with Damien. One of the things I want to actually point out: same thing. We have our minority certification. Let me give you the the line right now. There's more money available that we have inventory for. I can't take the money because I can't get the inventory. <laughs> that's that's the like that is the bottom line. You would think that. Okay, as the you know our platform streamers and stuff like that, there's advertising dollars that they can't access. See, we've had the same conversation. You can't access those dollars. We can't. We're minority owned, African American. I can sell Kevin better than anybody, but I don't yeah. have the So that that's a, that's a, that's a that's a bigger issue. But back to your question about those spikes. Um, that like we're going on our our eighth season. Um, that's been a very um productive relationship just from just from a, a the content standpoint and i don't have a stat in front of me i mean i could figure it out but it, it's you know billion views or whatever it is over all the series and stuff like this so it's been very successful for us the 
the success started on you on our YouTube channel though. Then then we just syndicated out to our fast um fast networks and that success continued on our fast networks from a viewership standpoint. Yeah, I I, I mean, you know, to me, the, the, those are the goodies that you'd always look for uh on YouTube. But I think that again, since 70% of fast viewing is on connected TV, exactly. uh, you know, and we haven't really mentioned OEMs that much, but I mean you know, kudos to to uh, uh, Roku and Vizio and LG and everybody else and Samsung TV Plus. Good Lord. Uh, and and by the way, Roku, as I mentioned on some previous panels of the last few years here, um, you know, they picked up a lot of Queeby. Uh, you know, sh shout out to Queeby. <laughs> Blasted for a Queeby. Uh, but but no, this is good experimentation. You know, people, I mean, you, you got to do it with big bucks. And if you're Jeffrey Katzenberg, you get $2 billion. So, uh, so he can spread, spread it, you know, I can speak to that mo model. Is this, this is an interesting scenario. So when Quibi launched, we actually did a show with Quibi against everybody's better judgment. Everybody what hit. was the show? It, Die Hard. We're, in our, we're getting ready to do our third season with um, Roku. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. 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 So the, yeah. But the model was interesting for us because the model that, you know, the Quibi offer was that, you know, they're financing the show. Then after two years, you get you get the show back in terms of rights. So you get ownership of the IP. So we did, which is the reason we did it and it was the right decision. So what happened was obviously when Roku picked up all the Quibi content, they relaunched Die Hard and it went to number one on the Roku platform. Um, and then subsequently we were, our two year window came up and then we then did an international deal with Amazon Prime for, for the movie. Um, we just um number number two just aired and you know we'll try actually and we're supposed to go into production on number three depending on what happens to strike we're trying to get a waiver but that's been an interesting model but it's done extremely well for us in in terms of it's done well on roku but then we actually own the ip and we're able to then monetize it after the you know after the 24 months of roku so that that's a really great model for you know for a studio for us because you get ownership of the ip and build oh yeah yeah yeah, I mean, look, you know, you kind of go back to the future with some of this. I mean, I, I I was a fan of the the Comcast, you know, glass strategy because I thought that was a cool thing. It go went back to like the late '40s and early '50s, you know, with Philco and whatnot. It's like, you know, buy your TV set, and maybe you'll get something out of it. Um, but you know, but this this is then why not? You know, uh, I I would expect to see ISPs and others get you know, more involved. I mean, I'd be like. Hey, 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 guys! You know, come, come on in. You know, uh, but, but that's that's not necessarily their business. And back to the point that uh, certainly Christina and Damien and Jeff have made: uh, nobody can sell your content, particularly if it's niche, uh, if it's ethnic, if it, it and and it's to the passion uh, verticals. I mean, I don't expect to see Bob Backish voguing in a gay club in Miami, um, but uh, now I want a, somebody to put that into stable diffusion or something and get some artwork of. Bob Backish, you know, uh, with a fe feather boa on or something like we'll that. We'll generate an AI meme for you. That would be awesome. And that that's the first mention of AI on this uh, uh, panel. And I wanted to kind of steer away from that. Um, but since I, I, I opened the bottle, uh, we'll talk about it for a few minutes. And then we will get to your questions because there's some excellent ones. So uh, just briefly about uh, uh, AI, any, any AI that you're using, either lightweight, like Veritone, uh, or anything else. Uh, I, I know, Christina, you mentioned something that's very uh, near and dear to me in terms of AI for uh, discovery and for uh, sort of sentiment analysis. Are, are you using that, Christina? Yeah, so we're we have we're still in the process of evaluating AI. You know, at the end of the day, AI has been around for many, many years. It's not like we're not using it. It's just that I think um, we're at a point in time where consumers are finally accessing more and more AI. So it's become this new big giant thing. And so um, I agree with the industry that we need to start doing more AI um, or, or rather being able to know how to tap into it in a safe manner. Um, and so we, Australia, are still evaluating it. It's, it's a process. Um, so, so new things to come. We know that everything's changing so fast um, and, you know, Things like when we use AI it could be their content strategy. It could be with how we do our monetization. So there's a lot of opportunities with AI that we're still looking to dive into and setting up certain priorities surrounding it. Uh, 
this, and 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 I I I think that that that's going to show. So, in the time that we have, I I do want to get to your questions before uh, this ends. Uh, Corey Sanders had the first question, which is, what content are you looking for? Uh, which sounds very broad, but Marissa, you laughed, so uh, maybe you can answer Corey first. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Uh, it's one we get uh, on the daily as as to what's going to stick. Um, as I mentioned before, I think. I, I would, I would stress that Fubo is open to experimentation. We like to lean into what does well, but we don't know that until we actually give it a shot. So we are definitely open for business. Um, most of the fast channels that we've added over the past year are just about having their one year anniversary on the platform. So we have a lot of eyes and ears into what's doing well, what genres are represented, what's not, what's doing, what are, are there any surprises? A lot of the fast channels too, as you mentioned, <clears throat> Jeff, are, are, are kind of a mix of some have live content, some don't, some are seasonal, some are. And, and so just because a, a network may not be doing well now doesn't mean it, it might not knock it out of the park, you know, in the fall season. So we've been open to kind of watching things. We're kind of looking in now and doing kind of a deeper dive into the analytics and, and what's mm -hmm. doing well. And then we'll kind of be able to fine tune, um, you know, our, our offering, but we still want to be able to pivot and offer a, a good, well-rounded kind of general entertainment con uh, content offering to support our, our, our sports first uh, product. And, and right. can I be back on that? Go. Chris, um, Chris, you bring up a really great point. And I think this is another thing, especially because we have three minority um, groups uh, represented on this panel is that, you know, as it relates to measurement, this is another thing the ISA is tackling. That's a big elephant in the room, right? We as LGBTQ or Jeff as, you know, addressing predominantly, I'm, I'm going to assume a black audience, Australian Mia addressing a Spanish audience, we should only be measured not against the mainstream, but against the total addressable audience of that subculture, right, of that group that we represent. And I think that's been a big, a big issue with a lot of the major providers and OEMs is that they're measuring against AMC's fast channel, they're measuring us against mainstream fast channels, and that is an unfair playing ground. That's another thing the ISA is tapping into and hopefully will be able to achieve with the measurement committee. Well, that's tremendous. Well, that, that that's actually a, a big sea change uh, to be sure. Uh, Christina, do you want to answer uh, Corey's question? The answer is no. Um, uh, <laughs> in in terms of in terms of content. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like at the end of the day, like we do a lot of analytics on like what do our 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 users and our our consumers want. And, you know, based on how much is watched, based on, you know, the time amount it was out there in, in the World Wide Web, you know, that's kind of how we can tell what is the type of content we should be producing and also what we should be showing on different distribution. Also, like, you know, our channels on Fubo perform differently than on Samsung TV Plus. So we need to like, you know, we need to curate um, and have a, a strategy for each different endpoint that gets shown to a user. So, you know, when it comes to content, we are, using data to support a lot of our our, our decisions. Right, right. Uh, Je Jeff, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, ours, our premise is very simple. I mean, our fast channel is called LOL Network, so it's multicultural comedy. Yeah, and <laughs> and, and uh, uh, one of my clients works with you guys. Uh, love that to death. Um, so Lamar, Stephen, I'm going to throw this one to, to, to you, Jeff. Uh, anyone else wants to chime in? Uh, thank you for this question, Lamar. Any tips for funding the creation of a fast channel for content owners, I've got, uh, or we've got more than 400 hours of nostalgic hip hop entertainment program, shout out 50th anniversary of hip hop. Uh, so uh, Jeff, do you want to speak to that? Because I mean, you know- uh, He has 400 hours of hip hop? Yeah. Okay, I'm giving my email address. You might have a fun- <laughs> Yeah. Hey, hey Lamar, uh, can you put your email in there uh and and then uh jeff will get in touch with you it, but what i would say though lamont in terms of funding i mean that i would be interested in looking at but if you tell me 400 hours of hip-hop the first thing i'm gonna ask is do you have clearances on the music do you have clearances on the artist that's gonna be the question like is, is it clearable that you can actually launch it yeah 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 and 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 by the way that that's a great tip for anybody out there uh in this audience both uh real time here this is streaming live but of course this will be on demand uh, so please pay attention to that. Uh, clearance, 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 clearance. Um, Jeff comes out of the music industry uh, and he's uh, fought these battles for, for years. Beth Rosen asks, where do you focus your advertising for the channel so potential users can find you? Right. Well, uh, Damien, do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, at first it was social when we first launched, but, you know, users didn't migrate from social um, you know, SEO still does really great. We're now optimizing within each of the different platforms that we have success in. 
we took our entire marketing budget and we spent it, we spend it all between like Samsung, Vizio, Roku channel, our top performing fast channels, uh, fast channels. We buy actual, we're in ad, we're, we're on the managed service side. So we're buying in uh, advertising inventory to promote ourselves and our content because they're not skipping from one device to another. They're in the environment in which they're used to watching already. And what's great is these, you know, these operators, they're trying to outspend each other. So we're just riding those coattails as they grow their audiences, we grow our audiences, and we take that data on the managed service side, blend it with the performance side, blend it with our ad network. And then we have an entire editorial team who basically goes to Marissa and all of our partners and says, here's a social asset. Here's like all the coffee you need for Pride, for Pride Month. Here's our stunts, you know? So that's our own earned media with the editorial teams of the operators. Now we've got that holistic approach from all four different different angles, kind of to Christina's point on what that uh, viewer journey looks like. Yeah. And and by the way, um, you know, Damien, you've, you've been really doing this for so long. And I think that uh, particularly with some of the, the miscues of big brands vis-a-vis uh, -vis pride in the last year, um, you, you need to write a book or uh, <laughs> seriously, or I want to see you more on mainstream TV, like CNBC, telling people, no, 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 no. Um, I'm serious, because because that that's going to help uh, everybody, uh, yeah. particularly with Fast. Amna Debral has an interesting question. I'm going to throw this one first to Christina. Uh, what are some key challenges Fast is facing right now? Okay, we talked about that. But here's the question. Uh, how are broadcast companies creating Fast strategies without cannibalizing traditional broadcast? Great question. Yeah, it's true. So I think one of the things that we were evaluating uh, three years ago is how do we even create a fast channel? Um, should we have different content? Should we use the same broadcast content? Um, so I think one of the things is that we actually initially when we first started was we used the linear feed and we just pushed it out to our fast distributors. And that was the easiest way to get up and running um, in the fastest method possible. But as we became more advanced, more sophisticated, we did start creating a channel that's much more curated for our fast users. Um, and this also includes, um, you know, nationwide, you have East Coast time versus specific standard time. So we created a, a channel that was able to encompass both um, parts of the US. Um, and I think like in terms of the curation part though, is there are, it's just a, in terms of cannibalization, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily it's true. It's, it, I think it does happen. Like, you know, linear viewers are switching over to fast channel, but that's kind of like, if you don't adapt, you're going to lose. So I think that at the end of the day that having it free and available for everyone is very, very important so that you can capture whatever, um, you know, we're historical linear viewers and making sure that we are able to be available for them when they don't want to use their cable subscription or broadcast mm -hmm. subscription anymore. Really, really great. Anyone want to add on to that? Uh, and thank you for that that question, Amna. No? Okay. Lori Marion asks, uh, because I, I want to get these in before we wrap here. Uh, great insights. How are you further monetizing outside of ad revenue? I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, what do you think, Damien? Sorry, I'm mute there. Uh, you know, I think there's lots of different ways. Like we license to AVOD platforms where it's we're not a consumer facing brand. We are licensing to SVOD companies as well. You know, but at the the forefront of what we do holistically as a company is we've chosen a lane, we're really hyper focused, and we're just scaling our fast and AVOD business as we speak. Excellent. Uh, Lamar comes back with a question which uh I, I want you to get creative with the answer. Uh, he asked, what is considered a successful fast channel? Mm. If I were asked that, I would say, well, my fast channel. So uh, <laughs> dumb question, Lamar, of course, it's my channel. No, no, seriously. But but but, but I, I don't want you to divulge any numbers you don't want to, because, you know, one of the things people are saying is, oh, where are the numbers in fast? Where are the numbers? In fast? Well, I would answer them saying it's probably the hit shows that you have. Uh, so, but what, 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 what do, cause each of you comes from, you know, so many different, you know, pieces of this fast ecosystem. How would you answer that? 
I think for me, like I, I actually come from investment banking. And so I think one of the things it's always about the numbers. So at the end of the day, I'm looking for like things like engagement. So viewership, time watch numbers, I'm looking for sessions. So how many sessions were, were open. So which indicates how many users there are. And then at the end of the day, what is the ROI? So what's that return on investment? Um, so those are kind of like the, the three major KPIs that I look for for my business whenever I'm seeing whether something is successful or not. Very and cool. I, and I yeah. would agree with Christina. I, I mean, obviously, the the nets that Jeff and Christina and Damien represent, their success rate on Fubo may be very different than our than our peers as well. So I think it's it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. Um, so I think it's kind of looking at each platform specifically and kind of digging into the data and analytics, like she mentioned, um, to kind of really figure out where those specific networks land on each specific platform. Yep. Uh, Nick Hart has a good question here on personalization. We talked a little bit about this. He says personalization has been on the forefront lately. Yes. Do you feel that fast personalization will make a big impact over the next couple of years or so? Anyone want to take that? So I don't know about specifically about fast personalization, but I can I can talk a little bit about just the personalization aspect to it. We, our product team spends a lot of time into looking into the algorithm and all the data points that each viewer uses um, and engages with on the platform. So Christina's homepage on Fubo may look very different than mine, may look very different than Damien's, which I think is part of it. So we use the algorithm to, to surface content that we think you would like and that you've consistently watched, whether that if you're a news junkie, you're a news junkie. But we also use that to kind of feed information and, and new content for you for experimentation. So while we always have usually some static carousels for some big tent poles event, or we had one for the Women's World Cup, for example, the the day to day we do always have some moving some moving parts and carousels to kind of surface and personalize that content so that we're Fubo surfacing content that's that speaks to me. Then I'm like, oh, that sounds good. I would like to try that. Um, so we've spent a lot of work and are working on kind of fine tuning all those data points to really push customers to what they think they would watch to keep them in the platform and engaged in the content. Excellent. Uh, anonymous attendee, well, anonymous, uh, do you believe the cost of AVOD original shows will start to go up similar to SVOD originals or go a different direction? It's Bob Bakish. It, he's the anonymous attendee. No, seriously, anyone want to uh, answer that? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. I would say that original con like the whole obviously like Hollywood in itself is in an upheaval with the strike right now. And the model is reinventing itself like, you know, there's innovation that comes out of hard times. Um, we've seen this in history. And I think that, you know, at least from our perspective, that uh, unscripted content, I can't speak to scripted content because we don't do that. Um, will be underwritten by brands. And I think that brands are willing to spend more money on content um, because they're looking for other ways to tap an audience outside of just your traditional display or video ad inventory. Great answer. Uh, and I think we have one minute left. Anyone want to uh, further answer our anonymous attendees question vis-a-vis -vis AVOD and SVOD? Well, Actually, I, I had one for, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, I mean, I agree with Damien. I mean, just, you know, traditionally the cost of of um, content is going to, especially for scripted, right? So that's why you're seeing a lot of um, unscripted. But to Damien's point, I mean, the brands are really kind of gravitating towards unscripted. So you're seeing a lot of uh, great unscripted content being produced. Yeah, and I think you just answered Beth Rosen's question, given the strikes, are you more willing to look at unscripted content that hits your target audience? Um, you know, yes, probably. And by the way, for those who don't know, uh, there is a writer with respect to podcasting vis-a-vis uh, -vis sag after So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and thank you for putting your New Fronts presentation because I'd seen that before. It's, it's quite fascinating. Uh, please take a look at that uh, as a rubric. I think, uh, Damien, you'll have some people who may be learning from that uh, as they should. Uh, but everyone has learned from this quartet uh, and as I said, fast goes to college. Well, this was a bit of a masterclass on fast uh, from some superstars, uh, Christina Chung, uh, Damien Pellicchioni, Marissa Elizondo, Jeff Clanagan. I'm Chris Paff. And I think uh, Steve's going to come back right now or, or Evan, oh, Evan. Here I am, Chris. That was, yeah, that baby. was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was, it was a fast track on, uh, on fast. Thank you very much. It was a brilliant panel and a lot of really good best practices, but also, you know, frankly, this is, this is the bleeding edge of, of where we are as a video economy. So I think it's a, a really good view from where that where that edge is going. Thank you all very much. 
Um, speaking of thank yous, I want to thank Wayne Goldstein for being a stalwart uh, of our conference uh, all week um, and putting uh, this time sitting around for the uh, end of the panel and putting the correct answer, uh, the Pogues, <clears throat> sorry, Wildcats of Kil Kilkenny. Um, Wayne, thanks so much for being right, for being first and for sticking around. Thanks again, uh, Chris, and to all the panelists, uh, all of you, uh, really fascinating information. Um, I want to remind everybody to come back in about uh, an, a half an hour from now at one o'clock um, for the next panel of Streaming Media Connect, Build, Buy, or Both, Sourcing the Tech Stack for Your OTT pro uh, Platform. Um, I want to thank you all for sticking around. Thanks again, panelists. We'll see you in about a half an hour. And uh, remember, all the panels from this week will be put up on uh, Streaming Media Connect's YouTube page next week. The link should be in the chat um, and I'll see you in a half an hour. Thanks everybody. Thanks Evan. Thanks guys.